So back before you decided to ruin everyone's um, concept of how the universe and reality work, uh, Albert Einstein was working on a thing called the photoelectric effect, which actually is what he won his Nobel Prize for, um, not all that <laughs> relativity stuff. Um, and the basic idea is that if you take um, a plate of metal, any kind of metal you like, and you hook up an ammeter, so that's, that's a device that measures current, and you connect it to a little wire like so, and then connect that wire to the plate, you have a circuit that's broken, right? Nothing can flow through this. Not only is there no power source to drive the current, but even if there were, there's this gap here. And so the idea of the photoelectric effect was that if you had a light bulb, some sort of thing here, like so, and you shone light on this plate, what would happen is that electrons would escape from that plate because the energy of the light was able to free them from the metal surface. And then they would get caught on this wire, flow through and back to the plate, creating some sort of current in there. And so what was discovered was if you took a battery, like so, and arranged it so that the positive plate was on that side, then that battery in the positive plate is trying to hold the electrons on the plate there. So there was a voltage you could set here so that these electrons were no longer able to escape. And so that's all well and good um, until somebody actually shined some sunlight onto this, this little apparatus. And even though um, the candlelight couldn't make it happen, sunlight could. And so the idea was that maybe uh, it was because sunlight is much, much, much brighter than candles. I mean, obviously, that makes sense. More energy, more whatever. So somebody came along and cranked up the voltage on this so that even sunlight couldn't rip the electrons off of that particular plate. And that was all well and good uh, until somebody came along with a, a, an, ultra, uh, ultra, an ultraviolet light source and put it nearby this machine. And even though it wasn't very bright, you know, it didn't hurt your eyes and it, and it wasn't particularly um, powerful, especially compared to the sun, that ultraviolet light was still able to knock electrons off when sunlight could not. So this, this posed a tiny little problem. Um, how is it that something so bright like sunlight can't liberate the electrons when a much less powerful light source is able to. And so the entire argument came something like this. So if you are sitting in your lawn and, and you happen to notice that you've got dandelions, you know, I just like to draw dandelions, and it's sunny outside, so here it is, um, minding its own business. If I were to take a ping pong ball and drop it on this dandelion, it's going to bounce right off of it. Because um, dandelions are reasonably robust and they can handle being hit by a ping pong ball. Similarly, if I took 20 ping pong balls and dropped them on this flower, uh, it's, nothing's going to happen to it. It'll just continue being a, a flower and there'll be ping pong balls everywhere. Because those ping pong balls, even though there's 20 of them, they're not powerful enough to be able to knock this flower over. It's not until you switch a ping pong ball for a golf ball, right? Something that has suddenly more mass that you're gonna be able to actually flatten this flower, right? Or if you switch it to a bowling ball. It didn't matter how many of those ping pong balls you threw. And I mean, this maybe crushing flowers is better analogy would be your, your little sister throwing ping pong balls at you. It doesn't matter how many she throws. Even if she throws a thousand of them at you at once, um, you just, it's just ping pong balls, who cares? But one bowling ball and we've got a problem. So even in this analogy, the way we, we construct it is the, the idea that, that light it isn't, isn't a wave the way that, that it was described in, in grade 11 physics. It's, it's also possessing particle properties like a ping pong ball. 
And so sunlight is weak and it just bounces off and it's not able to liberate the electrons. But other flavors of light do have enough energy and are able to ping the electrons off. So you can read more about this um, online and it will have much better detail. Um, what the point I'm trying to get across is that different flavors of light carry with them different amounts of energy and the formula for working that out is that the energy contained in a source of light is this number h which is Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of that light so h is um, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds not joules per second joules multiplied by second okay so if something has energy, that's okay. Um, but this this effect was that folks uh, that light light would come in and it would see an electron and it would ping that electron off. Um, well, that's not that's not uh, like a fueling up or or a heating up kind of effect. That's like a collision, like we did way back in the two D mechanics um, section. And collisions aren't about just energy. They're about momentum. So it turns out that light, as, as proven by the photoelectric effect, that light carries momentum. So P for momentum. And the way you calculate that is you take the same number, Planck's constant, and you divide it by the wavelength of that light. OK, so the idea here is that light, even though it has wave properties, it also has particle properties. So it behaves a little bit like a ping pong ball under the right circumstances. So the idea is that you get this little, this little pocket of light. Instead of um, a wave front, they're, al they're also considered like little, little ping pong balls all flying in one particular direction. And they each carry an amount of momentum equal to some constant divided by their wavelength and they each possess a certain amount of energy that you calculate by taking this same constant multiplied by their frequency okay so let's let's just let's just do some some calculations here our sun's average spectrum so that's the, the color you see the most coming out of the star is around, around uh, 500 nanometers. That's 500 times 10 to the negative 10, sorry, 10 to the negative 9 meters. So the wavelength is, uh, pop this, 10 to the negative 8 and then to the 7. It's 5 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Yellow. Okay, so some of the light that comes out of there is higher energy than that, uh, well, like with shorter wavelengths. Some of it is lower energy with longer wavelengths, but it averages out to about this. So just out of curiosity, how much energy does one of these things have? Well, I, I need to get my frequency from that first. So you'll need to remember universal wave equation. C is frequency times wavelength. So if it's light, speed will be 3 times 10 to the 8. I don't know the frequency, but the wavelength of this is 5 times 10 to the negative 7. So 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 5 times 10 to the 7, 10 to the negative 7, gives me a marker that's about to bite the biscuit. Six times 10 to the 14. And frequency is 
in hertz or per second. So these little little waves, these little wavelets are are five times ten to the negative seven meters long, and you get a, a new one. Um, you get you get six times ten to the fourteen of them going by every second. So that's that's a lot. <laughs> okay. So now that I've got a frequency and I have a wavelength, I can get the energy of these particular uh, bits of light. So HF, H is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. The frequency is 6 times 10 to the 14, giving me a total of. 6.63 is 10 to the negative 34. 3.978 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per thing. Okay, so if you're getting this much energy per thing, well, that, that means there must be a thing delivering that energy. So so what is this thing, right? Like allegedly, according to what I'm trying to sell you here, um, light comes in chunks, um, not waves, not just waves, but, but waves that operate like chunks or chunks that operate like waves or some sort of hybrid between the two. So we're, we're going to give this chunk of light a name. And, and so that name is, is photon. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. I have tried really hard to not use that word up until this point, and it's, it's challenging. Um, but this photon, a photon with that frequency, carries that much energy. Uh, it will also carry some momentum with it. Uh, so momentum would be h over the wavelength. So that would be 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 divided by this wavelength. Where'd it go? 5 times 10 to the negative 7. Give that a try. 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. By 5 times 10 to the negative 7 gives me 1.326 times 10 to the negative 27. And the unit for momentum was kilogram meters per second squared. Oop, kilogram meters per second. No squared on there. Okay. Lovely. So this the sunlight that's coming out of the sun, right? Because it has an average uh, spectrum around there. Each photon coming out of the sun has, on average, about this much energy, and it has about this much momentum that it can deliver to objects. So on the, the surface of the Earth, uh, at the equator, on average, yada, 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 the Earth is absorbing about 1,500 watts per square meter of energy from the sun, from the sunlight. If that's all coming from photons, then we should be able to figure out how many photons strike one square meter of the Earth's surface every second. So that's just, it's not a formula, it's just a, a proportionality rule. Um, so I'm just going to clear out some space here. So I'm going to take some sort of energy. So I'm going to take 1500 watts, which means, um, so watts per square meter, which means in one second, The Earth is absorbing 1,500 joules per square meter. Okay, so the the number of photons with this much energy, right? If I took that and multiplied it by the number of photons striking that square meter, I should end up with 1,500. So I can get the number of photons then if I took this and divided it by that number. So 1500 
divided by 3.978 times 10 to the negative 19 gives you 3.77 times 10 to the 21 photon per square meter per second. So that's a lot of little bits striking every meter. Now it's maybe not that many. Uh, keep in mind that Avogadro's number has a 10 to the 23 up there. So that's 1% of a mole. Okay, lovely. But if that's true, if the Earth is absorbing this many photons per square meter, it must also be absorbing their momentum. So just how much momentum is the Earth absorbing? Well, let's clear off some space here. So just how much uh, momentum is the Earth absorbing? Is the Earth absorbing from sunlight? Okay, um, so if I know that this many photons are striking this each square meter, I can get um, an amount of momentum per square meter by multiplying these two things. So momentum per square meter, uh, so that's momentum divided by area, would be 3.77 times 10 to the 21 photons multiplied by this much momentum each gives me times 1.326 times 10 to the negative 27 is 5 times 10 to the negative 6 kilogram meters per second per second per square meter. That's, 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 a, lot of, that's a lot of pers. Well, let's look at this here for a second. Um, kilogram meters per second per second. Well, that's kilogram meters per second squared per square meter. And a kilogram meter per second squared, that is the definition of a newton. Right? That would be mass times acceleration. So this little unit here, by taking the number of photons per square meter per second and multiplying it by the number, the momentum contained in those photons, has given me newtons per square meter. That's a force experienced by every square meter of the Earth. And that's every square meter of the Earth that's facing the sun and the force it's experiencing is away from the sun as the sun's light blasts the planet away from the center of the star. Well, so how much, how much force is that then? Because um, that's troubling. Never really considered that. Uh, so the Earth, the radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. And if I were to look at the Earth from the Sun, it's basically a circle. So the area would be uh, pi r squared. So if I took that radius of the Earth, 6.38 times 10 to the 6, and I squared it, and then multiply it by pi, I get 1.279 times 10 to the 14 square meters. So the cross-sectional area, right, the amount of, of area you see from Earth facing the sun is this many square meters. And each square meter is absorbing this many newtons of force 
So the total force acting from the solar wind, if you will, would be 5 times 10 to the negative 6 per square meter multiplied by the number of square meters. Take that number and then multiply it by 5 times 10 to the 6. negative 6. You get 6.39 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 Newton. So uh, 10 to the 6 would be mega, so that's 639 mega newtons of force just from sunlight striking the cross-sectional area of the Earth. Now that's that's scary. Um, just out of curiosity, if we were to calculate the force of gravity between the sun and the earth, just for comparison, uh, if you remember from our second unit, force of gravity is g, mass of one object, mass of the other, divided by their separation. I'm not going to worry about the exact numbers. I'm just going to do powers of 10 because we just want to compare to this. G uh, was 10 to the negative 11. The mass of the sun is 10 to the 31. Mm, 10 to the 30. Mass of the earth is 10 to the 24. And their rate, this power separating them is 10 to the 11. That'll be squared. So it's 10 to the 30 and 10 to the 24 gives me 10 to the 54. 10 to the 54 minus 11 gives me 10 to the 43 over top of 10 to the 11 squared would be 10 to the 22, which gives me 10 to the power 21, which is way bigger than this. So, do I have to worry about the Earth being blown away from the Sun because of the photon pressure coming out of the star? No, I don't have to because it's not anywhere near as close uh, to the force of gravity, but it is something to consider. And in fact, one of the things about about um, solar mechanics is that if you're at the core of a star and it has all that fusion action going on inside of it, then it's firing photons out in all directions, which pushes back on some of the material. And then that material is pushing photons out in all directions, which pushes back. And in a way, the sun is keeping itself inflated because of the photon pressure on the inside. So it's, it's puffier than gravity would normally make it because of this momentum being carried outward from the core by all these photons. So and that's part of uh, the, the process by which a star fails. Um, as it's young, or it's it's fusing hydrogens to make heliums. That's very bright, it's very energetic. But as it runs out of hydrogen, it starts to um, have less energetic reactions. There's fewer photons, there's less photon pressure, so it starts to shrink. When it shrinks a little bit, it gets a little more dense, then it's heavy enough to start fusing helium. So the heliums fuse together to become beryllium's. That's less energetic, but it's happening. So those photons, are, f are weaker, those photons have less energy, and so there's fewer of them, and so the sun shrinks a little bit more. And then those beryllium's try and fuse into uh, oxygens, and then, then there's a whole bunch of soup in the middle. And by the time you get to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you can't get enough mass in there. You can't get enough density to continue the fusion process. So fusion starts to stop, which means the photons aren't being produced which means this thing has less pressure coming from the inside and it shrinks further. And if it was heavy enough, it shrinks past that place where it becomes a black hole and it can finally collapse down into a singularity. So this photon pressure is, is one of the things propping up stars that are big enough to become black holes but haven't yet. 
And so when their fusion processes finally slow down to the point where there's insufficient photon pressure, then the collapse happens. Kind of neat. Okay, so we've got this idea of the number of photons um, per square meter per second. We can kind of use this idea to uh, check what, what light intensity is light, like on other planets, like on Mars or out at Neptune. So I'm just going to erase this and we'll give that a try. Okay, so allegedly we're absorbing 3.77 times 10 to the 21 photons per square meter per second at Earth's radius. So if you think about that, then there was the sun here in the center and, and Earth is out here, not to scale. And by the time we get out here, all of the photons that were created by this star have spread themselves out over the surface of a sphere because they go in all directions. So the, uh, the area of a sphere is uh, 4 pi times its radius squared. And so if I took all the photons, all the photons, and divided them over that 4 pi r squared, I should end up with this many, 3.77 times 10 to the 21 photons per square meter. Now, I happen to know that the radius of the Earth's orbit is 1.5 uh, times 10 to the 11 meters. So I'm going to park that number in here, and I'll get all the photons. is 3.77 times 10 to the 21 multiplied by 4 pi 1.5 times 10 to the 11 squared. So I'm going to figure that out. 3.77 times 10 to the 21 times 4 times pi times 1.5 times 10 to the 11 squared gives me 1.066 times 10 to the 45 photons per second. Okay, so if I wanted to know what the photon density was like out at Mars, all I'd have to do is take these photons and divide them over a larger spherical shell. As, as we get up to Mars' orbit, right, Mars is here, then that shell has expanded to have a larger radius. So if I were to take that then at Mars, uh, the total number of photons emitted by the sun in a second divided by the area of the sphere at Mars' orbit would be 4 pi, and I need the radius of that, which I looked up as 2.28 times 10 to the 11 squared gives me that divided by 4 divided by pi divided by 2.28 times 10 to the 11 squared gives me 1.632 times 10 to the 21 photons per square meter. If you look, that's, uh, that's less than half. Okay, um, and I had up here before that the energy was H, F, and if I replace, um, if I keep this in mind, then F is C over lambda. So this would be H, C over lambda. This is 6.63 times, this is going to be a mess. Let me clean up some space.
Okay. Um, so after all that, we had this number up there already for the energy per photon um, emitted by the sun on average. I did some scaling up based on Mars's orbit to find out how many photons are striking each square meter. So if this many photons are striking each square meter with that much energy per photon, then I should be able to figure out um, the solar intensity at Mars's orbit. So I would get that by doing 1.632, right, the photons per square meter multiplied by the energy per photon and I get and that is 1.632 times 10 to the 21 and 649.21 watts per square meter or joules per square meter per second, which is watts per square meter. So if you, if you notice the difference there, um, when you're on Earth, the most amount of energy you can absorb from a solar panel is 1,500 watts per square meter of your solar panels. On Mars, the maximum amount of energy you can absorb is 649 watts per square meter. So you need twice as many solar panels on Mars in order to get the same amount of, of power production on Earth. So, you wonder why Mars is colder than Earth is. Well, this is part of the problem, right? The further you go out, those photons are distributed over a larger surface area, so you end up with, with a smaller wattage per square meter. It also doesn't help that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, <laughs> but even if it did, it's receiving less energy per square meter than the Earth is because it's spread out over that shell. Okay, so there's one last uh, fun little little uh, calculation I, I would like to do, so I'm going to have to clean this off in order to do it. Okay, so I just recalled some of the numbers that we calculated for photons generated by the Sun um, at 500 nanometers, which is our average spectral um, production from our sun, the energy of those photons is this, which means there's this many photons um, being absorbed per square meter per second, uh, that should be per square meter as well, at Earth's radius. And it means that each of those photons is carrying that much momentum. Now, what happened before when we were doing a little bit of calculation with the Earth was that if you take m photons, uh, momentum per second per photon, and you multiply it by photons per second per meter squared, um, you end up with uh, 1.326 times 10 to the negative 27 times 3.77 times 10 to the 21. If I were to multiply these two numbers together, if I do that, 3.77 times 10 to the 21 multiplied by 1.326 times 10 to the negative 27, I get 4.999 times 10 to the negative 6. But that's just a number. It's the units that are interesting. The units of this one were kilograms, meters per second, per photon. And I multiplied it by this one, which was photons per second per meter squared. And so this photon and this photon end up dividing each other out. And so I'm at, I end up with 4.999 times 10 to the negative 6 kilograms, meters, per second squared, and a one over meter squared left over. And then this thing, kilogram meters per second squared, was newtons. per square meter. So there's force that you can absorb, force per square meter. So as a, as a bunch of, or as a, 
as a civilization bordering on space travel um, and we need to have some way to to get away from our planet other than gravitational slingshot one of the options that might be available to us is to build something called a solar sail which is basically a, a giant object that you have to make it light so it's not, not too much mass but has a lot of area so that when that area is pointed towards the sun the sunlight as it comes out will push like this at that rate so if I were to um, try and, and work this out, like suppose I had a ship that weighs um, 100,000 kilograms. So that's, why don't we make it a million just for fun? And we'll put in a three there just so there's a so three million kilogram ship that I want to get going. And suppose I want it to accelerate reasonably quickly. So I want it to accelerate at, uh, let's say, two G's worth of acceleration. So that'd be quite a quite a push backwards on you. Um, two G's would be two times nine point eight, which would be nineteen point six meters per second squared. Well, a mass times an acceleration gives you a force. The force I need to make that happen would be this. 3 times 10 to the 6 times 19.6 gives me 5.88 times 10 to that should be 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 10 to the 7. Newton. All right. So I've got this thing sitting here saying that the photon absorption, so like the solar wind at Earth's um, orbit, is this many newtons per square meter. So if I were to take this, this 4.999, and multiply it by, by an area, there's an area that's big enough to make my force this. Okay, so in order to make that work, I just have to divide this by this. Four point nine nine nine. Okay, so that divided by four point nine 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 times ten to the negative six gives me one point one. 7, 6 times 10 to the 13 square meters. <laughs> That's a lot. But if I could build it, and if I could get something that, that had that kind of radius, then I'd be able to put it uh, at Earth's orbit and experience 2 G's worth of force blowing it away from the, the star, the center of our solar system. Um, so how big is that? Well, it, it would have to be a, a circle, I imagine, and the area of circle is uh, pi r squared. So I'm going to take this particular number and divide it by pi, and then I'm going to square root my answer, and I will get the radius of 1.9 3 times 10 to the 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So, all you'd have to do, <laughs> you can maybe tell when I get this tone of voice that something ridiculous is about to happen. All you have to do is build yourself a solar sail that only weighs 3 million kilograms but has a radius that big. Um, now, radius of 10 to the 6, we've come across numbers like that before. That's, um, that's well, the, the radius of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 6. That's about a third of the radius of the Earth. So, you know, here's, here's Earth, and um, <laughs> there's your ship. Uh, so this is probably impractical. Um, that kind of acceleration is maybe not achievable, but if I were to shrink this, to a smaller number, I would shrink the sail that I'd need. 
So it's theoretically possible to use this solar wind and a solar sail to push an object away from the star and it will always experience that force away from the star as it flies out of the solar system off to whatever its destination is. So the problem set is going to ask you to do the energy and the momentum calculations for photons of different wavelengths and frequencies. It's going to ask you a little bit about intensity at different places in the solar system and it's going to ask you some questions about absorbing photons to use as a solar sail. Um, most of them are proportionalities, they're not formulas, so you'll have to use your brain to think about how you can turn newtons per square meter into newtons, etc. Um, should be good, good exercise. Um, so I will leave you to it. Good luck.